So as I mentioned last week, our new series on the seven ecumenical councils. So we're in the series of history now. <clears throat> and I reminded everyone last week that the origins of the councils come from Acts chapter 15. Who read their homework? Who did their homework? Who went home and read Acts chapter 15 last week? Oh. 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 Not even. Okay. So all of you get one demerit. Just one. Just one. But you all have an extra chance. So it is really important to get the character of the councils to read chapter 15 in the book of Acts. It describes how the church addresses controversy. So here we are, the first ecumenical council in the year 325 AD. What is a very his significant historical reality of 325 that was very different than the book of Acts? Who, who can tell me? What happened in the year 312 AD? The Edict of Milan. And the Edict of Milan made Christianity legal. Finally, after 300 years, Christians could legally declare themselves Christians. And on top of that, the Emperor Constantine declared Christianity the religion of the empire. Now, historically speaking, that has some difficulties that come along with it. And I think someday we'll be able to talk about how when the church is too cozy with the civic government, we have some struggles, some unnecessary problems within the church. But nonetheless, historically, St. Constantine declared Christianity the official religion of the empire. And around this time, there was a guy named Arius. Arius was teaching his people that Jesus Christ was not fully divine. He said, well, Christ was born. If he was born, he couldn't have been God. And so this was making its way around the church. We call it the Arian controversy. So Constantine, as the emperor, as the one who had the, you could say, the greatest interest in maintaining unity and harmony within the empire now, sees the church struggling with this controversy. And it's a deep theological controversy on the divinity of Jesus Christ. So Constantine gathered the bishops of the church and he called them to the city of Nicaea, which is in Asia Minor. Today it's in the country of Turkey. But it's Asia Minor. And he did it following the same pattern as we read in the book of Acts. Controversy, and they said, let's all get together now and we're going to discuss it as the apostles. And we reminded everyone last week, who were the apostles of the church? The bishops. Because through apostolic succession, every bishop was ordained from another bishop before him. And you remember we talked about ordination last year sometime in our series on the sacraments. If you forgot, go back and look at the video, you'll see it. So the church gathered and they determined that Jesus Christ was always God and he was fully human. So here is the issue. When you look at Jesus Christ, there's a word in the creed which we say today. The first half of the creed was written in the year 325. You could say it was like the minutes of the conversation. Remember in the book of Acts, they wrote down their decision and they said, now bring it to the people. 
the creed following the same pattern in the book of Acts. See why you have to read the book of Acts? Wrote down their decision. We know their decision is the first part of the creed. That's why we call it the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. The first part was written at the first ecumenical council in Nicaea. And we say, I believe in one God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and, visible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on, and there's a very important word in the Greek. Omousios. And normally gets translated into English as of the same essence with the Father. This word, I'm telling you, is a very controversial word because it does not exist in the scriptures. And in this wonderful little book, which is in English, by the way, it talks about all of the councils. And so if anyone ever wants to borrow this, you're welcome to borrow it. It talks about the councils. It talks about the, de the debate that was going on in terms of the divinity of Christ, etc. And it gives a special essay about the word omusios because it did not exist in the scriptures. And one of the difficulties, and the church says, well, if it wasn't in the scriptures, remember, the scriptures are central to our, to our faith. And he actually writes a note here that within the, we actually have the fancy word called it is the acts of the meetings, like the minutes of the meetings. You can actually go back and read, and most of them are in Greek. You can read about the debate that took place. And one of the things they, dis they, they, they determined was that if they limited themselves in this particular subject to just the words that were in the scriptures, it would be too easy to discuss away the divinity of Christ. And so the church, led by two great saints in this particular topic, St. Athanasius and St. Basil, they led the charge to accept this word omousios, of the same essence. And so St. Athanasius, I just want to read this just very quickly. He quotes him here. As St. Athanasius says, that the Son is not only like the Father, but that as his image he is the same as the Father, that he is of the Father and that the resemblance of the Son to the Father and his immutability are different from ours. For in us they are something acquired arising from our fulfilling the divine commandments. Moreover, it adds later, the Logos, meaning Jesus the Son, the Logos is always in the Father and the Father always in the Logos, as the Son and its splendor are inseparable. St. Athanasius really was one of the greatest church fathers of history. And so he was able to lead this conversation of 318 bishops of the church. And finally, they adopted this understanding, omusius, the same essence of, God, of, of the Father. And we begin the first section of the creed. Notice there's no discussion of the Holy, Tr the Holy Spirit in the first council of Nicaea. That comes in the second council which we're going to talk about next week. But the big controversy theologically is the divinity of Christ. And it was settled once and for all in the year 325 AD. Settled, end of story, cannot be changed. And yet there are Christians today who refuse to believe in the complete divinity of Jesus Christ. They believe he was just a very, very holy man, or that he was sometimes God, sometimes man. But we, being loyal to the history of the church, have never changed our position. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man in omusios with the Father of the same essence. While the church was gathered, they said, you know what, since we're here, my language. Let's 
put a little bit of order to our church because there had, you know, each community was doing a little bit of their own thing. Remember I said a few months ago that even the scriptures in 325, it was not yet standard of which books were in the Bible. So these councils helped establish all that information. One of the things that was addressed, and I know that Father Samson wrote about it in the bulletin, was the day of Pascha. In the year 325, the Christian world was still not yet celebrating the resurrection on the same day. Some was this day, some was that day. Even in one city sometimes, one church would have it one day, one church would have it another day. And so the council, well, while we're here, why don't we talk about the date of Pascha? And it was in the year 325 that the bishops determined the calculation for the date of Pascha. And the calculation is how nice that Pascha is coming. We began the Triodion today. The resurrection is to be celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox. And that was determined in the year 325. Has nothing to do with the Jewish Passover. How many of you have always heard growing up, we have to wait for Passover before we can have... Not true. Not true. In fact, in these canons, there's actually a canon that prohibits us from celebrating Pascha with the Jews, meaning using their calculation. So it's a urban legend that we have to wait for Passover before we can celebrate Pascha. So that's one of my personal missions on the face of the earth, to eliminate the urban legend that we have to wait for Passover. We don't. So you are now my new messengers. When it comes time to us having Easter this year, a week after the Western Christians, I don't want to hear any one of you or see any one of you in your Facebook pages say, well, we have to wait for Passover. Say, no, 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 no. We do not have to wait for Passover. And I'm going to watch every one of your Facebook pages to make sure we know that. The, so here's the funny thing. They use the same formula, but it's on a different calendar. The reason our Pascha and their Pascha is different is we use the exact same formula on a different calendar. And that accounts for the difference. And that's the only difference. So it's, it's not because we want to get half price on candy and Walgreens? Well, I'll tell you what, cheap candy is definitely a, a, definitely a blessing. But as I discovered moving to Tarpon Springs, too many Greeks in Tarpon Springs, they don't discount, they don't discount the candy in Tarpon Springs. I've got to go all the way to Tampa to get cheap candy. <laughs> anyway, so there were several other canons. I'm not gonna, we're not going to talk about all of them, but there were 20 organizational canons that the church established in, at the first ecumenical council about the order of the church. Because, the, because God is a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. And so whenever the church would see something disorderly, when they got together, they said, now let's put these things into order. Interestingly, it wasn't until the 700s that finally the entire Christian world celebrated Pascha at the same time. It took 400 more years after the decision was finalized to finally trickle down to all of the communities, believe it or not. You know, there is no Instagram and Facebook. You, know, you couldn't Twitter the, uh, the council decisions back then, right? So it took another 400 years. It wasn't until the 700s that finally the Christian world celebrated Easter on the same day. And then for roughly 700 years, the Christian world was united in the celebration of, of Pascha. And then 
somewhere, I think somewhere in the 1400s or 1500s, I don't remember exactly when, forgive me, the Western Church switched to the Gregorian calendar. And so since then we have been separate again. So for the first 700 years, we were, we were different times. For the middle 700 years, we were the same time. And for the third 700 years, averaging out the two, we've been at different times again, right? So believe it or not, we have only been globally united on the celebration of Pascha only 700 some odd years of the 2000 year Christian history which is one of those things I think helps us keep things in perspective. You know, we, again, one of the reasons Father Samson and I like doing these conversations is it keeps us honest to history. Because sometimes we remember our Sunday school class, which is always the most basic elements, but now that we're adults, we have, you know, we're responsible for knowing more and understanding more, so.